Income tax 2022-2023, tax type or categories. Let's do some wealth preservation with tax preparation. There are many different types of taxes, many different ways to tax, and throughout human history, governments have applied just about every general category of taxation that we know about, and therefore, with regards to tax, there's nothing really new under the sun at this point in time. We're not coming up with grand new tax schemes at this point, but rather, we're basically just tweaking, adjusting tax schemes that we have seen throughout history. This course is focused on the United States income tax, the primary tax system funding the federal government. It's an income tax system. Therefore, the tax is being applied as we earn uh, the money. We can compare that to another system often used in democratic republics at this point in time, and that's going to be the sales or usage tax system, where the tax is then being applied when a purchase is being made. So because those are kind of like the primary tax systems used in democratic republics, it's useful to try to categorize the characteristics of those primary taxes. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it systems. Now in the United States, we have the federal income tax system that blankets the whole country. And then we have the states which have the sovereignty to choose their own tax systems. Many states uh, mirror the federal income tax system. So therefore the states will have a similar income tax system and we can apply many of the rules on the federal tax system to the state because they're going to be mirroring the federal tax system generally. However, some states might deviate from that and be using more of a sales tax or usage tax uh, type of system in order to fund the state needs. So in that case, of course, people would have still to pay the federal income tax and deal with an income tax system. And then you've got a state tax that's gonna be applied on the local level. One of the great things about the United States is the ability to have the states to be sovereign, to do their own kind of taxation on a local level so that we can do some experimentation. We can we can see about how are those states doing? Uh, is the taxation part of the justification or reasons for any kind of differentiations between states? And those are the kind of like testing grounds. So as we think about different types of taxes, we could try to categorize them in terminology that you will often hear are a flat or proportional type of tax, a progressive tax and a regressive tax. So these are terms that often come up whenever you see someone that's going to change the tax law. So we might be talking about something that we already have a federal income tax system and they're trying to put a new law in it to do something or the other, whatever they're trying to do. And you will start to hear this language such as, well, they're trying to flatten out the tax code or they're making the tax more progressive or less progressive or the tax code is being regressive. Or if you're trying to compare a sales tax or usage tax system to an income tax system, people will often use these terms. Now, again, whenever you hear these kind of debates about taxation, then you've gotta be careful because people are gonna to try to use absolute terminology when usually things are much more complex uh, and nuanced than to use that absolute terminology. So when you hear like a flat tax, people are often thinking that you have just one tax rate. So like you like you give 10% to charity is a gen, like a gen, that's kind of like a flat tax if you were to apply that rule. If you were gonna say, I'm just gonna say 10% is gonna be coming out of your income, that's a flat tax. Uh, if we have a progressive tax, that means that we generally have a tiered tax system. So people, wealthier people generally are gonna be taxed more in a progressive kind of tax system. So in the United States, we're you know quite proud. Often people are proud of the progressive tax system because it's taxing uh, people more uh, on the higher uh, income side of things. And note that, th th again, there's debate already on that because the flat tax also taxes people more as people's income goes up because 
of 100,000 is more than 10% of 10,000. But with a progressive tax, now you've got a tiered structure where the rates are actually going up as the dollar amount goes up. But note that these two aren't necessarily absolute differences. It's not like you could say, well, you have a flat tax or a progressive tax. We have, we have a progressive tax because we have multiple tiers, but you can imagine things being more or less progressive, meaning do you have more tiers, <laughs> more layers of taxation, or is the top layer of tax really high? If like, if you're taxing someone that makes a lot of money, like a hundred percent at the top level, you could say that would be more progressive uh, or less, uh, or less, or less flat. So you can use this terminology to kind of not be just a, a, a static thing, but basically more or less. And then regressive is often a term that's going to be used to kind of uh, downplay a, a tax. So a politician that doesn't like whatever tax policy that's being applied is going to call the tax policy regressive, which would indicate that the people on the low end side of things are going to be uh, bearing more of the brunt of the taxes. Now, oftentimes, all these terms are thrown around with very little nuance. And, and therefore, uh, if you really want to see the whole picture, you've got to dig into it a little bit more <laughs> than what is actually presented oftentimes. So it's useful to know these terms. So a flat or proportional tax, tax rate remains the same over income levels. So social security, for example, you can kind of think of as a flat type of tax. So in other words, a flat tax, if you were to apply it on an income tax system would be say, you're going to tax everyone 10% or you're going to tax everyone 15%. And if you earn uh, 100,000, then you're taxed the same rate. You'll be paying more because you're applying that 10% rate to 100,000 versus someone that earns 10,000 is going to be paying a lot less taxes. Uh, but you're not actually changing the rate. Now, the benefits of a flat tax are that it's going to be quite simple to calculate. And oftentimes when you're looking at a business or in, in an economy, simplicity is actually very important because you want to be able to project how much taxes you're going to pay because that's going to be a cost to your household. That's going to be a cost of doing business. And if it becomes very complex to know what that cost is, that adds what we call uncertainty into the equation, both on the household level and on the business level, which makes it difficult to plan and could be a dampening effect, have a dampening effect on you know economic growth and so on. So in the United States, we have a, a social security, which is has a kind of a flat tax system. This isn't the income tax. This is what's called the payroll tax system, where we're paying into social security and then we're gonna we're gonna possibly get a benefit uh, at at the retirement age of of from Social Security. So this Social Security is kind of linked into the income taxes in some ways because the it's if you have the W twos they're dealing with Social Security and so it's reported on the W twos. And but if you don't if you have your own business then you're self employed. So we'll have to deal with the Social Security stuff uh, in that instance when we're thinking about income taxes. But in any case, you could see that if the rate was 6.2%, 40,000 times 6.2% is 2,480. If someone earned 100,000 times 6.2%, they would be paying the 6,200. That's basically a flat tax. The benefits of a flat tax is it's easy to make projections, to budget, to forecast into the future. So for example, if you're currently earning $40,000 and you think next year you're gonna earn $100,000 and you're trying to say, well, how much tax am I gonna pay then? Well, if the rate is the same, it's a pretty easy calculation to make. Now note that the social security isn't exactly a flat tax. There's some caveats, some deviations from basically a pure flat tax type of system, which is a point we need to make here. And with every type of tax we're talking about or every tax law or change that we're going to be putting in place or talking about, because oftentimes, once again, these terms are thrown around as if they're absolute terms. This is a flat tax. This is a progressive tax. But when what happens in actuality, when a tax is put into place and when changes happen to the law, they start off with something that's quite simple, such as a flat or progressive structure, and then they make deviations to it. 
which may make it more or less flat, more or less progressive, or have some other complication that usually complicates the system in some way, shape, or form. With regards to the social security, it's structured a little bit differently because it's not going into like the general fund for the federal government to pay the general needs of the government. Usually the military is the primary need for the federal government side of things, but rather it's going into a fund that's gonna be paying out social, social security benefits. And the idea or concept of social security has kind of changed over time. When it was first put into place, many people thought of it more as a welfare type of program in that uh, it's there to support people who live past their life expectancy and therefore aren't able to save enough money for retirement uh, because in part people are living longer, for example. But more and more it's being thought of like as a government kind of retirement program because we're putting a whole lot of money into the social security and we're expecting to for it to be paid out to everyone that put the money in to the social security so kind of the the idea of the social security what it's doing what its role is i think has changed a bit over time so uh and there's and with regards to social security and the taxation there's a cap in terms of if you earn more than a certain level of social security, which goes up every year with inflation, we'll talk about more in future presentations, then you don't pay any more tax after that point, which would be odd if it was your primary like income or your primary funding of the government type of tax. But the, the reason that kind of makes sense is that the benefits that you're getting in retirement are going to be based on how much money you paid into the system. So if you earn more money, you're paying more money into the system. You would expect then, if we're thinking about this as a government funded retirement kind of system, you get more money back. But obviously they're trying to, they're trying to taper off so that people that are more well off don't get as much of a benefit. So if your income goes over a certain threshold, you're not gonna get any more benefit when the benefits come out in retirement age. And that's kind of the rationale to say, well, you shouldn't be paying you know, more money in at that point in time. So we'll get into more debates on on uh, the social security a little bit more and we'll deal with that when we get into self-employment tax and stuff, but that's the general idea. The next tax category is a progressive tax where taxes are calculated using multiple tax rates that increase with the tax base. So our federal income tax system is indeed a progressive tax. However, again, we wanna be careful of thinking about those two terms as polar opposites, a progressive tax and a flat tax, because oftentimes when we're making changes to the tax law, we can argue that those changes are flattening the tax or making the tax more or less progressive. So let's get into that in a little bit more detail by just getting a general conceptual idea of the progressive tax. So as many people often uh, know, we can see that the tax rates are gonna go up as the income goes up. Now, this looks fairly basic, but it actually gets quite complex in terms of the calculations and also quite therefore complex in terms of making budgets and forecasts into the future. So we have our income categorization over here. So if it's not over 11,000, then we have a rate of 10% of the taxable income. Now, when we apply this 11,000, we got to think about where that's going to be applied in terms of the tax formula. That's going to be generally the taxable income. So that complicates things a bit too. It's because we got in deductions that are going to be involved to get to like the taxable income, which is kind of like net income. And then we have credits that are going to complicate things as well. But when we're just thinking about applying the tax rate, we've got the 11,000, uh, 10%. And then if it's over 11,000, but not over 44,725, we have the calculation of 1,100 plus 12% of the excess over the 11,000. So what in the world does that mean? Well, that means that we're not taxing the entire amount. If you earned something between 11,000 or your taxable income between 11,000 and 44,725, let's say you earned 44,725, we're not gonna tax just the 44,725 uh, at the 12% because we're gonna tax that first 11,000 at 10%. So you've got this layered kind of system. So I'm gonna say, okay, how would that, how would I calculate, what does that mean? Well, if I earned exactly 44,725, it would be something like this, 44,725 minus the 11,000, that's gonna be taxed at the 10%, minus the 11,000, 
That means that the 33,725 of the 44,725 is taxed at times the 12%. That's 4,047 plus the 1,110% of the 11,000 plus the 1,100. So uh, hold on a second. Let me do that again. 44,725 uh, minus the 11,000 times 0 0.12 is that plus the 1100 and that's going to be the 5147 which you can see is the next layer down here so here we have if you make over 44725 but not over 95375 so you're somewhere in between here you've got a 22 percent rate that 22 percent is not going to be applied at your full taxable income if let's say it was 95375 uh, but rather it's only going to be for the amount that is above the prior threshold. So now you've got some tax or some earnings taxed at 22%, some taxed at 12%, some taxed at 10%. So if you were to calculate that manually in a, in a calculator, you're saying, well, hey, that's getting a little complex. And then if it goes up to over 95,375, but not over 182,100, so that means anything in between here is now taxed at the top tax rate of 24 percent and some of your prior income is taxed at 22 some of that is taxed at 12 some of the prior income is taxed at 10. so now you're applying one two three four tax rates to the one income and obviously we could see how this increases over time so that means that as your income goes up you are being subject to a higher tax rate up to the 37 uh, percent and notice also that this is for a single filer so these tables will change and we'll talk more about them in the future when you get to like married a uh, married versus single and so on but that's the general that's the general uh, idea of it and you can see that it can get kind of complex if you were trying to calculate this by hand so using a table structure like this can make it a little bit easier and then we have other tables and obviously tax software that makes it easier to actually uh, calculate the tax. But the, the main point we gotta make here also is that when you hear people say that if I earn any more money, that's gonna push me into a higher tax bracket. There's sometimes you hear a misconception of that. So for example, if, if you were being taxed at, at the 44, 12% is your highest tax bracket and you're saying, I don't wanna earn $1 over 44,725 because if I earn 44,726, then I'm going to be taxed at 22%. Well, that's not that's not the case. That what's going to happen is that one dollar that you earned is going to be taxed at the 22%. So it's still it's still a disincentive to earn more money because you're going to be taxed at higher rates. But it's not like it's not like all of your income is suddenly taxed at 22% if you go over a certain threshold, and that's often kind of a, a misconception. But uh, even though taking that into account, there is, of course, still a disincentive to earn more over time. Because if the government is taking 37% of your earnings, then you're less likely or less motivated to earn than if they were taking, you know, only 10% uh, of your earnings. So that's the general idea of it. Now, uh, to actually calculate this, obviously, we're basically dependent on either tax tables that are provided to us or we're dependent on the tax software. So that can be quite cal complicated to calculate. Many people argue, well, what's the problem with that? Because I have tax software, so it's easy. I can calculate it, no problem. But the other problem with it, of course, is projecting into the future. So if you're trying to say like, I earned, I earned 40,000 this year and next year, I think I'm gonna earn 100,000. You can't just you can't just look at your tax rate and say, OK, well, what is that going to mean that I'm going to owe on federal income taxes? Because now you have to apply this progressive tax structure and try to then project what you're going to earn. And of course, this project, this progressive tax tables change uh, every year as well. So you don't know exactly what the progressive tax table will be. And obviously, this is just one component of actually calculating the tax because we're going to have deductions we have to deal with and we're going to have tax credits and stuff that we'll have to deal with which also also feed into the picture so it, it actually gets quite complex quite quickly it, and you can say well after the fact it's not that difficult to figure out what you what your taxes are after you've earned it 
but you're supposed to calculate the taxes as you're earning it, right? Which makes it a little bit more difficult because for example, if I started a new business and I earned $11,000 in the first quarter or something like that, I could say, okay, how much do I owe the government? I wanna give them their share. Well, you can't give them 12% because you're not gonna earn only $11,000. You gotta project how much you're gonna earn over the year, which maybe you have no idea, but you have to project that so that you can then figure out what the proper rate would be or how much you should pay them based on the progressive tax rate. So that definitely adds some complexity into the situation, which adds a little bit of uncertainty, which you would think would dampen a bit of of the of uh, GDP growth and whatnot. Now, note that changes in the law, when changes in the law happen, the changes will often be of a type where they're going to make something more or less progressive. So you can you can imagine people saying, "I think there should be more layers in this thing, so that we have so that we have we're taxing when as people earn more money, they should have higher tax rates applied to them." So in that case, it would be more progressive. Uh, which a lot of times it sounds good. Obviously the term progressive sounds good. And the idea of people that have the money paying more to some extent is a good idea. You know, although you don't want to dampen GDP, actual growth in the economy, because that's the thing that ultimately funds uh, the, 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 the growth that everybody is going to be participating in. So, or you can imagine someone saying, I, I would like to flatten this, meaning I would like to just say, let's have just less categories. We're not going to take it down to a flat tax, but for, for goodness sake, let's, let's make it a little bit more right? They could, they could try to flatten it down a little bit, or you can imagine people saying, well, I'll keep the number of, of different categories here, but I'll change, I'll tweak the percents so that possibly the high percent I'm going to make really high or something like that. And that, and you would think that that would be more of a progressive tax system then, because the higher level income earners, you're tweaking their rates up, or you can flatten it out and say, well, I'm not going to change the number of tiers, but I'm going to make the rates more uh, closer together instead of having this big, a big jump if I earn, you know, from 44, 725 up. So you can see where the debate comes in. The debate doesn't usually come in. Well, flat tax, no progressive tax. No, we already have a progressive tax. The debate comes in in terms of, should we make the progressive tax more or less complicated? Should we make the progressive tax more or less flat? What's the argument between something being more quote fair uh, and more, and what's the argument between what's gonna be making something that's gonna be more uh, conducive to actual GDP growth because the growth ultimately is what everybody's kind of living on. And then we've got the term of progressive, of regressive. Now, regressive is always going to be a term to kind of uh, downplay a tax. So if a politician doesn't like a tax, then you're going to call it regressive. So the tax rate decreases as wage base increases, meaning the tax burden is going to be more heavily on the lower income individuals, which is, of course, not what you want. You want the taxes to be on the people that can uh, afford to pay the taxes, but also you want the taxes to be delivered, you know, in a, in what we would call like a fair type of way and, and whatever that uh, basically means, right? So sales tax may cause this, uh, for example. So on a, on a sales tax system, when we compare like an income tax to a sales tax in the United States, we often have this argument of saying, well, maybe we should just go to a usage tax or a sales tax system and tax people like many places in Europe and many states do when they earn the uh, revenue, as opposed to when, when I'm sorry, when they spend the money as opposed to when they earn it. So that would be more of a sales tax type of system. And that could be a fairly simple system to use, but you would think it would be very difficult to actually apply that on the federal government side of things, because that means you would have to completely dismantle the income tax structure, which I feel like that's politically even if it would be a good thing to do, it'd be very, very difficult uh, to do. So I don't really think, I think more likely what would end up happening is you end up putting in a sales tax on top of the income tax. And now we'll have two taxes that grow like crazy. But in theory, you can argue which is better a sales tax or an income tax. And the people that like the income tax would say that the sales tax is regressive. And the idea on that would be uh, the people that are buying stuff 
when you're buying stuff, are you buying stuff out of necessity or are you buying stuff out of because you want to buy stuff? Do you have the capacity to save? The argument being that if you're a low income individual, you're spending all of your money buying necessities, food, energy. That's what you're spending your money on. And so you're spending 100% of your earnings on food and energy, basically. Whereas if you're wealthy, you're earning more than you need to consume. You can save money and therefore you are not, you're not paying any taxes on the money you're saving, meaning a sales or a usage tax actually incentivizes savings. Whereas what we have an income tax uh, often incentivizes, does not incentivize saving. You know, spending is actually good because some of the stuff we spend on could be like deductible stuff. But again, that's way, that's often way too simplified of an argument because you, you can think of a sales tax type of system where, where it could still be a non-regressive type of system because all you would have to do is to say, is to say, well, uh, if we're talking about a sales tax and, and low income individuals spend all of their money on food and energy, how about we have a sales tax system where the tax is applied on everything except food and energy, right? That's all you'd have. And then, and then of course, the people that spend all their money on the necessities wouldn't be paying any tax and the taxes would be paid by those that are buying like yachts and whatnot that are spending their money extravagantly oftentimes. And then, and which would be the wealthy individuals and they're often spending more money than they earn because it might be old money, right? They're spending money that they inherited, not money that they currently earned. And so they might be paying, you know, they're paying more taxes on, uh, they've made more taxes on what they even earned. So it's quite possible. So it's, it's not really fair again, when you hear the sound bites of, well, you know, the sales tax is regressive and the, and the income tax is a progressive tax system. And you, you've got to kind of dig a little bit deeper because there's often different ways that you can tweak the tax code. And obviously, no matter what taxes get put in place, the government usually tweaks them the wrong way. <laughs> and so they make it completely complicated. So if, if you replaced the income tax with a sales tax, you could make a sales tax work, but it's likely the government will tweak it to make it ridiculous. You know, that's kind of the, the trend that seems to happen. But in any case, those are some of the general terms.